All right, we'll take this next caller. Caller, welcome to the show. Thanks for tuning in. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hey, name's Tarek. I'm calling from California. Okay, very good. Welcome for, welcome to the show from California. All right, what is yeah. the question for um, Rabbi? My question is, uh, given that in the middle of the book of Exodus, uh, Moses is talking to God, and God basically says, you can't see my face, or you'll, li- or you'll like, die. Uh, right. Why do Christians believe in the Trinity? Like, how, uh, all the stories of Jesus interacting with people contradict the Trinity, like at every stage. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Thank you for calling in. If you want to hang up, you can watch in for the answer, okay? Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Bye-bye. All right, Rabbi, take it away. So the question is, why, why do Christians, virtually all Christians, believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, which uh, the Trinity is a Christian doctrine. The word was coined by a church father, Tertullian, a Latin church father from North Africa, from Carthage, uh, became a Christian in the year 197. He coined that phrase, uh, coined that word, and it was a very useful word because, in truth, in North Africa, if you wanted to speak, if you wanted to convert pagans, you wanted to talk about your God in triads. This was an issue. I don't care what your pastor tells you, that Christians were ripping their hair out over, fighting over this. This was the big fight. The only other fight that was, it wasn't as big as this. The other fight was over when Easter should be celebrated. I won't go there because it's beyond the scope of this uh, show. I do cover it extensively in volume one. So well, why, do, why do Christians believe in the Trinity? Okay, so Christians are, convention, conventional Christians are, I'm going to use this word, and people are going to be puzzled, and Christians might be offended. Please don't, because there's a reason I'm using it. Christians are stuck with the Jewish Bible. And, and to the Christian, I know you're going, you're like, like jerking at that statement. But it means that we are seeing in the Christian Bible, Jesus is completely subordinate to the Father. Completely. Okay? I mean, it literally says in John that the Father is greater than I am. Jesus in John's Jesus. That, I say John because I'm not going back to, to Mark, an earlier adoptionist gospel. What that means is beyond the scope of the question. But will we find the highest Christology, that means will we find Jesus the, the most exalted is in the book of John. And yet in the book of John we find the most subordinative texts which is, is complete subordinate to the Father, John 5.30. I can do nothing of my own but of the one who sent me. But you... Um, and, and I'm, I don't want to get into a lot of it, but it, to this very deep, because this really could be... In fact, this is one of the longest chapters in of my book, okay, in volume one. But it is very easy, even though the, the, the idea that Jesus is God, that means equal to the Father, he is God, was not only unknown to the writers of the Christian Bible, it would have been considered absolute blasphemy. And I just want to, one caveat, because I know all the Christians go, they're like throwing things at their TV or their computer or whatever it is, and they're going, but the Jews said that, that the Jews were going to stone Jesus because he made himself equal with God. Well, and I don't know why Christians say that, because the point of the Gospels is that the Jews are wrong about everything. So the fact that the Jews wanted to stone Jesus and accused him of something he didn't do is exactly find everywhere in the Christian. So why in the Christian Gospels? So why do you use the Jewish response and say John 10, 30, 31, 32, 34, 33, 34? Why using the Jewish response to measure what Jesus is saying? It is so clear in the Gospels that non-Christian Jews are wrong about everything. Okay? So... Do you understand? And everybody misses that. And I'm like, and I, and I read Christian scholars, and they write this, and I'm going, why are you writing this? This is so. Uh, but I will say this point, that if I read the Christian Bible and 
one caveat. I'm not going to go into it because the answer will be too long. And if you understand uh, the gods of the Greco-Roman world, when we use the term Greco-Roman, generally we're referring to a period from about 200 BCE to about 200 CE, where gods are not all created equal. There's the great god who created everything, Zeus, Greece, uh, Greek Empire, Jupiter, its equivalent in the Roman Empire, and there's a whole tier of God, the Olympian, the Twelve, so on. and then you finally get to that lowest tier of God. Those are called the Son of God, which you find in the Incipit of the Book of Mark. Okay, Incipit is that. So, uh, 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 I probably shouldn't use a word that's not uh, that's not conventional, but it, it means that opening passage. This is the. The, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But the point is um, that in the ancient world, the lowest tier of gods were the man gods, were half God, half man. The emperors of Rome, all of them were made gods when they died. Caligula was this amazing emperor who ruled from uh, 37 to 41, and uh, he, he managed to become a god before he died. Leave it to Caligula. Uh, and, and they were healing people. Octavius, Caesar Augustus, Vespasian, they would touch, uh, Josephus tells us this, Vespasian, he would touch blind people, touch their foot, and they would become, they would become whole. I mean, blind people, he would put spit and thing in their eye, and they become, we know, that means the his, Roman historians are recording this. Okay, Mark's opening, Mark's in Kippet is there to press against Caesar Augustus, that Jesus is the Son of God, and who recognized at the end of Mark, and that's the Roman centurion. That's the elegance of the book of Mark. It's an, an interesting book, actually. Here's the key point. Even though the doctrine of the Trinity, as Christians, um, as Christians believe it today, as Orthodoxy um, was unknown to the to first century Christians. I can put a little caveat there. I think any reasonable person can, reading the Gospels, can see what direction it's going in. Okay, when Jesus, it, when you and you have Mark where for the first eight chapters, no one even know who Jesus is. I mean, no human being knows who he is. And then John, he is walking around going, I am, I am, I am, I'm the bread of life, I am, I'm divine, I am everything. That is a very, very different Jesus. So we can say, okay, look at Mark, and then I'm obviously shooting past Luke and Matthew, moving into John. It's completely different. It is inconceivable that the author of Mark knew anything about Jesus walking around saying things like that, because there's no way he would consider uh, such claims, not of divinity, but claims of, of, of authority. Uh, it, it would be inconceivable that he or the Q source would have ignored that. So therefore, I will say this, that the that I can now look back in hindsight, and it's true, I do have that advantage, and say, I know exactly where this thing is going to go. And it's going to go in one direction, that Jesus is going to be divine. And in fact, by the time we get to Ignatius, the earliest church father, essentially, um, he is saying that Jesus is God. He doesn't define that, seek to explain it. My Not my senses, I am sure, Ignatius just did not have the intellectual requisite to possibly explain that because there's a problem there has to be one god if the father is god if jesus is god you've got two gods how do you work that out ignatius doesn't deal with that but there are very bright minds who are just struggling with this ripping the hair out of their head now you're not going to get this from your pastor and if you go to fuller theological seminary they're going to tell you everybody believed in the trinity what am i going to tell you okay it isn't, okay? It, 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 but every Trinitarian has to reverse engineer it and go back to the Christian Bible like it was always there and then use these very torturous texts to prove it. We all know that. Um, 
so what we see the trajectory where this is going. By the second century, we, we do have Jesus as a completely divine being, uh, absolute divine being, uh, by Marcionites, uh, a very wealthy man from Asia Minor who, um, who proposed that there were two gods, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, uh, utterly incompatible, and Jesus was a full-blown God, and it was a very popular... He was ultimately thrown out of court as a heresy, although his ideas would affect the way Christians think to this day. Um, uh, Tertullian, a, a very bright man, really tried to work this out. Um, and, but his a solution to how you have one God, but the Father's God, Jesus' God, was ultimately that Jesus was subordinate to the Father. And there was a point in time where the Father exists and the Son didn't. And he would even mock what would be today Orthodox Christianity, saying that, that God was pleased with himself. It, it, the Old and the New Testament doesn't even make sense. What happens is that it goes for the origin, who I believe, in my opinion, was the church's brightest apologist and theologian, and I think most Christian scholars would agree that he was the sharpest mind that the church ever produced. He produces ways of solving, and they can't. And Origen's ideas on the nature of Jesus are ultimately condemned as heresy. Just Origen was so influential and so brilliant that he's never like thrown away like garbage. He's always held as as a shining light in the church, although his view on the nature of Jesus is heretical. I'm not going to go into it. So therefore, I can easily see where this is all going. So by the time we get to the third century, we are we essentially looking at a number of beliefs about Jesus. I mean, but, and all of them are that Jesus is God. At that point, Christianity has already developed for, for a few centuries, and everyone believes that Jesus is a God. And you're going, well, why? And the reason why is, is because um, studying or being a student of history is very difficult. We live in a completely monotheistic-oriented world today. You have to be monotheistic because we know the science. We know the, the science of carbon. and, and part, We know it. We know it. It's got to be one. It's one. That's it. Okay. Back then, so the key, the key is that they're trying to. They're stuck with the Jewish Bible, and I use the word "stuck" deliberately. It means they have to. Ultimately, the solution must be that there is one God, but the Father has to be God, and the Son has to be God, and we see in the Christian Bible that the Son is constantly subordinate to the Father. Begging the Father. In the book of John, remember I said, I, I, I've mentioned this many times, and what makes John different than the synoptics are many things. The length of Jesus' ministry, who he is, the kingdom of heaven, it can go on and on. But, um, you know, one of the things that are, is very unique to John is we have these huge dialogues in John. Huge. We don't find that in the synoptic gospels, with very few exceptions. There's just, but John has dialogues between Jesus and the Father. I mean, read John 17. It just goes on and on and on. And Jesus begging God, begging God, begging God that the, that the disciples should be of one accord, be one as we are one, John 17, 11, and so on. Well, so therefore, we ha Jesus is completely subordinate to the Father. By the way, that answers the question of John 10, 30, when, you know, we are told Jesus says, I and the Father are one. We know now what John had in mind from John seventeen eleven. The Greek word there is hen. It means one. It is not, this is not rocket science here. So, therefore, what happens is, by the time we come to the fourth, we, we're entering the fourth century. The estimates are 5% of the Roman Empire are Christian. Uh, of course there were some Ebionites running around, but they were crushed. Of course, there were some Marcionites hiding out there, but they were basically crushed. They were thrown out of court. And what we are left with are two groups vying for what should be the orthodoxy of the church. Uh, in these two groups, one group said that, the, both, first of all, both groups said that Jesus was divine. Okay, It's a big mistake to think that there was one group who said that Jesus was human. That is not the case. The two major groups that will enter uh, the Council of Nicaea in 325 at the behest of Constantine, 
all believed that Jesus was a divine being. People f uh, often get their information from websites and from books like, uh, you know, all these crazy novels. It's not true. Every, but the question is, to what extent was he divine? Was he completely of the same substance of the Father or not? And this argument would take place over the course of months. And Constantine is, is not happy with what is unfolding. We have a historian, Eusebius at the time, so we know what happened. And ultimately, Constantine realized that he had to unify the empire and under one doctrine, under one theology, under one emperor, and ultimately said, it's voting time. And when voting time came, and Constantine, the emperor said, voting time, only two, only two bishops had the, I don't want to say backbone, because I, of course, disagree with their conclusions completely, but they said that Jesus was not, ultimately, was a point in time in the Father exists and the Son did not. But everyone else said, okay, we're, we're in on the orthodoxy. The two that disagreed uh, were, were exiled. And, and what, the, what we are left with from the Council of Nicaea, and I'd be remiss if I didn't include the Council of Constantinople in 381, where the doctrine of the full trinity, where the definition of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit is worked out thoroughly, and it's a really important time of the Council, Council of Constantinople because they have Theodosius, who's emperor, and the last emperor to rule of the empire, to rule of the, as, the East and West. So it's, this is really important. Uh, of course, at that point, what the doctrine of the Trinity is, as is promulgated as orthodoxy today, uh, is surrender. We give up. I mean, it's, we just give up and just say the Father and the Son are eternal, are, are light, very light, are very light. They're both co-eternal. Jesus was from the beginning, from eternal as the, as the Father. And, of course, then you're left with the amazing question. If Jesus was as eternal as the Father, there was never a point in time that the Father existed and the Son did not exist, And what does son mean? It doesn't mean anything. You see what I'm saying? What does the word father then mean? It means then how is God, how is whoever the father is, how does, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. When a word can mean everything, it means nothing. What does the son mean? It means nothing. It means how is the father, the father? Do you understand what I'm saying? So what the the doctrine of the Trinity is as it was finally hammered out under Constantine, as it was hammered out in the fourth century, is a surrender in saying, "We just this is it. This is what you must believe in order to be regarded a Christian in good standing." And to give you a sense of how how important this was, is as I told you, we entered the fourth century. We actually entered the fourth century with an emperor who was who was who truly did persecute Christians. Uh, five percent. The estimates are five percent. The, the information, a lot of the information we're getting is through the church. So you know, you take with a grain of salt. But let's say five percent of the empire was uh, Christian. But most estimates would say that by the time we walk out of the fourth century, it means we, you know, Aug you know, Augustine and so on, fifty percent of the empire is Christian. But it is a surrender, saying. It is the greatest mystery, which can't be explained. And that means I surrender. Everybody, origin, is coming up with complex ways of how do you have one God, but Jesus is God. And uh, they're all these brilliant Christians are trying to figure it out. They all fail because it can't work. X cannot equal Y and also not equal Y. It just can't. So it ultimately becomes a mystery which the human mind can't fathom. The, the question, of course, f has to be asked. And that is, if God always believed in the doctrine of the Trinity, and if Moses believed in the doctrine of the Trinity, if Moses of blessed memory, all of us, shalom, if he believed in the doctrine of the Trinity, why would he withhold that information? It's, it's not, I'm sorry, that's not a strong enough question. It is, I, it, when, 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 when this show is over and you're alone, you have to ask yourself the question, did Moses believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? 
Did Joshua believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? Did Isaiah, Ezekiel believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? And if he, they did, why would they ever withhold that information? Because, read Exodus chapter 30, read Exodus 28 through 31, 32. Please read it. And you will see there, graphically, over and over again. In fact, it's repeated so many times, many people read it for the first time and go like, all right, I got it, I got it. Like, you've got to believe in Glenn God and no other. Like, I got the point. That's how it's like, like, our... The, ex the existence of the Jewish people depended at that time, not, not 1,600 years later, at that moment depended entirely on worshiping God properly in truth. And it says that. And God says, if you don't worship me properly, then I will drive you out and I will destroy you. And yes, I will leave over remnants. You will not be utterly destroyed. Then how could God withhold us? How could this answer that Christians try? They try their best. I feel bad for them. I, the nice ones, I cry for them. They go, progressive revelation. That's impossible. So therefore, Moses did not believe in the Trinity. I'm sorry. And what Christians are doing, good people are, is they're raised with the Trinity. They're told by the pastor they'll go to hell if they don't believe in the Trinity. They will not be saved. The blood of Jesus will not save them. It's a false gospel. And then some guys who I... Really nice guys, but they'll go up and go, of course the Trinity is all over the two stuff. You just can't see it. And everyone, every, any non trinitarian is going, what? Well, Jews and Muslims are going, are you insane? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really true. Every Muslim knows that what I'm saying is true. We watch people who are, who are intelligent, who are Christian uh, scholars, and going, oh, of course the Trinity is open in the New Testament. And then we go, really? Please. Or it's open in the Jewish Bible. Where? It is nowhere. The best a Trinitarian can do, and you know this is true, is they can seek to go to the Jewish Bible and say that certain words employed by the Hebrew Bible can be construed to mean a to convey a plurality in the Godhead or a complex Godhead. That doesn't tell us three in one, and doesn't tell us the equality of God. None of that. And what happens if a prophet arises tomorrow? In Islam, that would be impossible. But if someone came tomorrow, so what? He's now going to be the fourth god and then the fifth god? None of those are a, safe, a fail-safe method that would block it. But we do not have a Trinitarian formula. If we don't have it, it just it is, it isn't there. It, it is more easy for me to prove that watching I Love Lucy is one of 613 commandments in the doctrine of the Trinity. That's the truth. <laughs>